forward. And I am set to go. There we go. Hello and welcome to Sun River Books and Musics, a presentation of a conversation in writing native. We have with us David Pesco Wombly Wyden, who lives in Colorado with his family and is an attorney by day and an author by passion. His book, Winter Counts, just went from hardback to paperback. And believe me, if you pick this book up and read it, you will not forget Virgil Wounded Horse. Uh, that is one memorable character. Uh, it is gritty, involving, and uh, we'll leave you thinking, I promise. Uh, next up, we've got Jane Kirkpatrick, author of about a gazillion uh, historic fictions that are all based on real people, generally strong women of the West. She has a new book coming out in the first part of September. Uh, the uh, Healing of Natalie Curtis, about a concert pianist who melts down before going on for her big debut with the Philharmonic uh, and finds her passion in trying to defeat the code of offenses that prohibited Native people from um, dancing, singing, or enjoying their culture. And Jane will be with us on September 4th uh, at Sun River Books and Music in person. It will be a space limited event and it is a ticketed event you will need to be vaccinated for the event. So just email me at sunriverbooks at sunriverbooks.com if you want to attend. And then we have Craig Johnson, my favorite cowboy, author of uh, the Longmire series that launched an incredibly popular TV uh, show. Still get people coming in almost on a daily basis saying, when is that coming back? And uh, in the series, he has my favorite Native American character, Henry Standing Bear, dead sexy, funny, and uh, a guy that you really want to have at your back. Very smart, our Henry Standing Bear. Um, his new book is Daughter of the Morning Star. And Craig has a tendency to show us some of the things that are wrong in our world. And in this case, it's going to go to the taking of Native American women that have disappeared from the reservation. Uh, chief, a tribal chief, Lolo Long, the only woman in his writing thus far who has been able to uh, resist Henry Standing Bear, has a niece who is uh, uh, a uh, champion scorer in basketball for her high school, and she's been getting threats. So now I'm going to turn it over to our, our panel here and throw out uh, a few ideas for us to uh, let them talk about. And the first is that we're talking about writing native, so perhaps cultural appropriation. Uh, what happens in fiction if men can only write characters that are male? Uh, you can't write about space aliens because I don't know many space aliens. And you can't write things set 200 years ago unless you really have a long life expectancy. So guys, what do you think? Shall, can we only write what we are? Well, at some point <laughs> along the way, somebody said you should only write what you know. Um, and I think that puts a lot of people off because, you know, what do we know? It'd be pretty boring if only I could only write about me, this white, you know, middle class, boring person. Um, but what I know is from my experience. And so, and it's also from what I can find out by listening to other people and by letting my imagination go somewhere. So I'm I'm of the belief that whatever, whatever the genre is, that it, it's important that we listen to that story and write that story. And out of that, I think, can come not only information that informs ourselves, but also hopefully that um, touches other people to figure out, hmm, I wonder what that would be like for me if I was a space alien or if I had to deal with that kind of conflict. I'm glad Jane jumped in because it was going to get really quiet here. You know, if we <laughs> So, um, I, I, Dave, you're next. I think you're you're because if we work our way down the line from my screen, I think you're next. So you should just jump in because I'm sure you've got a lot of interesting things to say about this particular subject. Let me unmute myself there. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, you know, first of all, I just want to say thanks for inviting me, and and especially to you, Craig, because I think you suggested me. And you know, folks, if you don't know, Craig Johnson is has been one of my favorite authors for a long time, and I've I've said this to people 
in person, everywhere, I said, you want to find somebody that writes about natives the right way, you need to read Craig Johnson's books. I'm a big fan of the Longmire series and the books, and I can't wait for this new one. And Jane, I am absolutely delighted to meet you as well, you know, and thank you for inviting me to this event. So, um, you know, to get to the, the, the question, you know, I, I get asked this so often, uh, people come to me at conferences or virtually or whatever, and they say, can I write about Native Americans? And I tell them, I'm not the writing police, okay? You, you, write, you write if you want to, okay? You know, and I do believe that people should have the right to create in whatever space they want. But I do give a qualifier, and that is I tell people, think about why are you choosing to write about somebody that's outside of your own experience? Are you writing a protagonist in, in, you know, are you writing in their voice? If so, make sure you're doing it for the right reason. Do your research and avoid the stereotypes. I think if you do those three things, you think it through, you do the research, and you make sure that you're not writing into any stereotypes, then, then I, I think you're fine. But, you know, I know a lot of folks have different opinions on this, and this is just my two cents. <laughs> I, I, I guess I'm, I'm last like that, but um, once again, uh, I have to say the same thing. This is a wonderful opportunity for me. Like that, I mean, you get this question periodically, but you don't really get a chance to really go in depth um, with this kind of a question. Generally, what you get is like, you know, maybe a couple of paragraphs to answer like that whenever you're doing a book event or something. Um, and so I just am, am thankful, you know, to Dion and Jane, like it, and particularly to David, like it for being here, you know, this evening, like that, because this, this gives us a chance to actually talk about this a little bit more with a little bit more of a sense of detail like that. And uh, I think it is an important issue. Um, yeah, I think that, that a number one, like that, what David said, um, yeah, you, you know, you can walk the tightrope, but you better get it right. You know, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you know, if you're going to try and, you know, utilize like a different cultures, societies, time periods, all these things. I mean, Jane, you can probably, you know, speak to the, the aspect of, uh, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the foamers, I guess, is the, the, the term that I, I tend to use when I was writing uh, Western Star it had a lot of trains in it. And I had a train aficionado tell me, oh, the foamers are going to eat you alive. Like, and I said, well, what's that about? And he goes, oh, no, they just, you know, they, they, you know, they, they foam at the mouth every time they talk about trains. Like, so if you get one single thing wrong, you know, they're going to eat you alive. Like, and I think that, you know, boy, you know, if there's anything that kind of like sets me back and keeps me from trying to write in a period piece, it's I'm afraid that those detail oriented people are going to just, you know, eat you up alive. Like, and it really doesn't matter, you know, like how, how well you do it. You know, there's always going to be a certain percentage of people that I think are going to go after you like that. And, and I think Jane's the one that has to bear the brunt um, for that. I'm afraid like it, she does a magnificent job like that of uh, making sure that all the details are correct like that and making sure that the, the storyline, you know, holds water like that. And I think that, you know, as far as, you know, cultural appropriation, as far as um, the use of natives, um, in your books like that. To me, you know, there are a couple of different things. The first one would be, it would not be a, an accurate representation of the place where I live and the people that I know if I had this vacuous hole where, you know, all the Northern Cheyenne and Crow people that I know, you know, were not, you know, allowed to be a part of the books. That would be a horrifying thing to do, you know, because an awful lot of, you know, really what makes um, Northern Wyoming, you know, and Southern Montana um, what it is and, and where it is, like it, are the native people. Um, it's just a, a magnificent addition, you know, to anything that I'm attempting to write. Um, and then the, I always, whenever I'm, I'm, you know, whenever I'm thinking about this particular line of thought, um, the one that I always think of is that there was a, a great speech that John Steinbeck um, gave when he was getting his Nobel Prize um, for literature. And one of the statements that he made was, is that good literature approaches a universality of the human condition. And I think that's the, 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 the real key element, you know, to the whole thing for me. You know, what we do, you know, the things that we write, what we're attempting to try and do is give anybody, an, give, give the reader an insight, you know, into these people. And, you know, when you carve out an entire group of people, you know, and set them aside and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Or you pigeonhole yourself, you know, by saying, I'm only going to write about my sex. You know, I'm only going to write about, you know, my ethnicity, uh, my locale. It, it really gets kind of stupid really quick. I mean, that galvanization, you know, it, all of a sudden, you know, like men aren't allowed to write about women. Women aren't allowed to write about horses. You know, it really gets kind of stupid really quick like that. And so 
to me, I think he really struck on something there as far as that, you know, that, that universality of the human condition, that we all have so many more things in common than we have, you know, as a difference like that. And to me, that's always what I fall back on whenever I start, you know, feeling a little bit of heat like that, or, you know, cultural appropriation or uh, political correctness in those lines. I'm always thinking, you know what, it's for a much greater good, it seems to me. Yeah, I really I like them. I especially like the term foamers because I'm going to hang on to that one. I got to refer to that before. I just, you know, there are people for whom it's really important that things get accurate. And I think that goes to the, the question of universality, that how the way we find that universality is by doing, doing the hard work of, you know, the research, trying to identify, you know, what's the history. Um, one of my favorite books recently is called The Indigenous History of the United States. Um, and I really have liked how um, this particular woman has looked at the history of the United States um, from the point of view of Native Americans, as opposed to the stories that, you know, the, that uh, non-Indians have always told. And so finding those resources, um, I think really is critical for finding that universality. So I like that, yeah. So David, on the next one, uh, let's start with you. David is a registered member of the Lakota tribe. He can uh, maybe fill us in a little bit on, on that, but um, some of the books that are written about different ethnicities or groups or uh, genders or whatever are uh, derogatory. And, uh, and we try not to have any of that at Sun River Books and Music, but it, uh, how, how does that affect if somebody is writing and not doing the kind of research that Jane and Craig uh, put their heart and soul into and, um, and writing from a point of, of uh, prejudice or not understanding, how does that affect the young people uh, that are uh, Native American when, when they read things that make them feel their lives are limited or that they can't achieve very much? Well, thank you uh, for that question, you know, and yes, I am, uh, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation. There are seven different divisions of the Lakota people, and then we have the Dakota and the Nakota. So we're a, we're a big, happy family, uh, but I am of the, from the, the Sichangu band, um, and our reservation is in uh, uh, South, uh, South Dakota, uh, just bordering Nebraska, and you know, so there are a lot of hurtful books out there, and it's a strange thing. I've been watching, I watched the first episode of a brand new TV show last night called Reservation Dogs. Saw it on, uh, 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 I want to say Hulu, and Hulu. it's done by, yeah, yeah, Hulu, and it's done by uh, a gentleman named Sterling Harjo. And, and then I, as I, was, I just got back from a, a, an event and, uh, out in South Dakota, and I was listening to an interview with him um, on, with Mark Marin, who does a really cool podcast. And so this, the director and creator of Reservation Dogs was talking about this very issue that he talked about when he was a kid, he would watch all of these Westerns where natives were shown to be the bad guys, the evil people, the malevolent presence. And that is tremendously hurtful to native kids growing up. Native kids growing up seeing, you know, the natives in the old Westerns as, as just evil, you know, that, that did have, I think, an incalculable damage upon Native children. That the happy news is that there's a brand new generation of which I'm fortunate to be blessed with these folks right here, that are I think writing about natives in in the correct way. You know, there are good natives and bad natives. Just there are good and bad people everywhere. So I think that these books that that have that play into the stereotypes can be harmful. Now, having said that, I'm not for censorship. You know, I am not for pulling books. I'm not for banning books. There are some books that I don't care for, but I, I personally would not advocate pulling them or, or censoring them. I think we let them fight it out in the marketplace of ideas. If, if, if somebody's writing something that has a dangerous derogatory stereotype, stereotype towards Native Americans, then somebody should review it and, and, uh, um, and, and get it out there that way. Having said that, you know, there are some books that I, I guess I wouldn't take this too far. There are probably some books that I would not allow in a bookstore. Maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know what that would be, but I can see there is a line, but I'm, you know, I'm willing to let the ideas duke it out. So I'll, I'll shut up here, but I think that's a really wonderful question. <laughs> 
So I, I like your comment there on books you wouldn't have in a bookstore. So maybe I'll, I'll throw a new question out for you, all three of you. What about the way that bookstores curate books? Because we definitely do. Um, there are books that do not come in our store and I don't care how high up they get on the net, the New York Times bestsellers list. So how do you feel ab about the obligation of a bookseller for um, making sure that people know about your books, which are uh, showing people in a more realistic way and uh, maybe trying not to have the books where um, certain ethnicities or groups are all trying to blow up the world as we know it. Craig, go for it. <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. <laughs> this is horrible. Like we have too many like you know nice authors that aren't willing to jump in on top of each other. Like I start talking like it. But yeah, I, I think you know obviously uh, of course like uh, there's an aesthetic involved. Like uh, whenever you're a bookstore owner, you know you're going to make the call like uh, as to whether it is you know. And I I think what you're referring to there like that is um, is a quality of writing. I think is what you're talking about. Also, um, knowing you as well as I know you, Dion, I know that like you know you read every book that comes in the bookstore, and, and the thing for you is is that you know well it's always going to be a question of like is it a good book um you know whether you know the material like or the way it's done and all of this like that you know definitely has an effect you know on whether it is that you're going to carry the book in the bookstore but you know it's always you know there the old statement i love is there are only two kinds of book good books books that are well written and books that are badly written like that you know and we all try and avoid being those authors like that that uh, you know that do the badly written books but uh, but yeah i i think that you know um you know the, the, the key element, you know, I think for me is, uh, is once again, that humanity like that. And I have to agree with everything that David said. I mean, and, and his book, you know, Winter Counts, like that, uh, he's got this, you know, enforcer, this, this native enforcer. And the very first thing he does in the book is get his ass kicked. Like that. And I thought, I really like this book. Like that, this is good. Like that, because it's not predictable. It's not going to be, you know, something where, you know, you're going to start this book and, you know, it's going to be a James Bond kind of character or something like that. I mean, he, he's very, very realistic. He's very, very believable like that, you know, and you feel as though, especially if you've spent time in Indian country, you've met this guy, you know, this guy. And, you know, to me, that's good writing is what that is. Like, and so it's always going to come down to that. It's always going to be a question of whether it's good writing or bad writing for me. Okay. I've always been grateful that you have carried in your store. Um, I think of books as a super spreaders, your super story spreaders, um, <laughs> and, um, and have been you know, critical in my own, my own writing career as an unknown, relatively unknown writer. Um, but I think bringing in books like I think of Sherman Alexie's book, um, the absolutely true story of a part-time Indian, I think that won the National Book Award and then it was banned. I mean, it was banned locally in for school districts and so on. And I just think having the courage to carry those books anyway um, really speaks to the importance of independent bookstores and, and the kind of decisions that you made. Maybe, you know, maybe you'd make more money if you sold certain kinds of books, but it's, um, I'm really grateful that I'm on the shelf um, with other authors who I really admire. And so I appreciate that you do that and, and that you take that risk and, and maybe sometimes just don't make, make the buck that you would have made if you carried that other book. So, so kudos. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane. Uh, I'm a big Sherman fan and uh, the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian. I just love that book. Uh, so let's see. So, Craig, you've got friends on the reservation. Jane, you worked uh, on the Warm Springs Reservation for years. Mm -hmm. And so all three of you, and why don't we start with Jane this time? Uh, what do you do to prepare for writing with uh, as a Native character? Because I'm assuming as an author that you almost like live in that skin for a little bit. What do you, what do, you do to uh, jump into that, uh, that role? So what I have tried over the years is to actually go to reservations. Um, so some of my stories have had seminal um, characters. Some of them have had Iowa Indian um, characters, as well as Warm Springs characters. And of course, at Warm Springs, I could actually interview elders and interview descendants of the people that I was writing about, which really opened great doors. Um, it's harder to find. I, I didn't know any Seminoles when I started to tell that story um, that's set in Florida. Uh, but 
from connections, which is one of the great things about Indian country is that everybody seems to know somebody else who knows somebody in another on another reservation. And so I was able to make those connections. Um, I also, you also have to have the courage to, you know, go someplace where you're, you're not sure how you're going to be received. And so at, on the Oklahoma reservation, I just, I drove there and I went in there and said that I was working on a story about a woman named Marie Dorian, who was an Iowa Indian um, uh, person, a uh, character in my, in my novel. But the amazing thing was that I had, I was mispronouncing her name. So I said, Marie Dorian and, and the, the history person, um, preservationist is kind of nodded and, and the chief that I got to meet sort of nodded. And then I gave him a newspaper article about her and in the middle of the conversation, he came out and he said, oh, you're writing about Marie de Roin. And so in my, you know, I had never, I never would have heard that if I hadn't gone there if I hadn't listened um, to what he had to say. And then it was like the doors opened. He knew who I was, who I was writing about and wanted to be as helpful as, as he could. But it was those little tidbits that really um, made a difference. So, um, so that's one thing is going there and, and you know, opening yourself up to looking stupid sometimes and just saying this, I wanna be as authentic as I can. And so please correct me, please, please tell me if I'm screwing up. Um, and I've never found any, any tribal people who didn't say, you know, be willing to help me do that. Um, so I think that's a huge, a huge part of it is just going there and then being open to listen. That's, that's the biggest thing. Craig, how about you? What do you I know you talked about doing rituals on the reservation and uh, <laughs> the sweat lodge and all that. So what do you do when you're getting well, into Henry skin? You know, it, it's, you know, the, anybody that's probably heard me talk has heard me tell, you know, one of my favorite quotes is the one from Wallace Stegner, where he says the greatest piece of fiction ever written is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. And what a crock that is like that, because that's kind of what you do, you know, whether you try and cover yourself by like, you know, having that, dis, you know, the disclaimer at the beginning of the book or not like that. But, you know, the difficulty that I run into on a general basis is, is that, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book, a series of books in a state that only has 500,000 people, you know, in it. Okay. So generally, Whenever I, I put somebody in my books and I'm doing a library event up in Gillette, you know, somebody will say, is that so-and-so from down in Rock Springs? It's in your third book. And I have to say, I can either confirm or deny that maybe the person that you just mentioned. Like that. And then um, the other side of that coin is, is that, you know, I, I do include a lot of the Northern Cheyenne in my books uh, simply because, you know, they're the closest to Crow uh, coming in close second. But um, there, there are only 5,000 enrolled members of the Northern Cheyenne tribe. And so whenever I stick one of them in my books and change the name, they all know who it is that I'm talking about. Um, and so it, it's kind of an ongoing thing like that, that, that everybody up there knows exactly who or what characters. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I get lobbied. Um, to a certain extent when I'm up on the res like that, you know, how come you haven't written about my uncle or there was one time I was doing a, uh, a school event over in Lodge Grass over in the Crow uh, Reservation like that and this a very earnest young man raised his hands like that. He says, I have a serious question for you. And I was like, okay, here we go. And he said, uh, why would you take, you know, a character that's so exemplary of all of the fine qualities of the Crow people like Henry Standing Bear and turn around and make him Northern Cheyenne. Like that, and that was, I was like, okay, I don't know where to go with that one. Like that, so, but you know, for me, that's that's a lot of it. I mean, you know, you, you, you try and like, you can't help but use the people that you know and try and, you know, utilize them in the best way that you can possible. Um, a good friend of mine, Charles Whiteman, like that was just, had one of the most incredible senses of humor like that and was one of the tribal elders. And, you know, some of the stories that he would tell me, and I would even check with him, I would say, are you sure? Can I tell this story? He's like, oh, everybody knows that story. Go ahead. You can tell that story. It's okay. Um, but yeah, it, it is an occupational hazard because everybody knows who I'm writing about. The other thing I do is, is that anybody who's close, like, at, like definitely Marcus is my go-to guy um, for a lot of uh, the information that I utilize in the books. He knows about which books I'm going to write, you know, a couple of years before I ever get around to writing them, because I'll start doing the research, you know, a couple of years in advance. Like, and then, you know, I, I tend to refer to it as the creek bed method of research, which is, you know, I don't do a lot of, you know, writing the notes down or anything. Generally, I just pack all the information in and then 
whenever you look through the clear water and, and see, you know, whatever the shiny things are that are on the surface, you know, the creek bed, that's the things that have to go into the book. Those are the things that you retain. Those are the things that you hung on to, like that. And, uh, you know, and those are the things that need to go in the books, like that. And uh, it, it seems to work out pretty well. But Marcus, you know, is great. And if he doesn't know the answer, you know, to, you know, whatever it is, you know, that I happen to be asking him about, he'll point me in the direction, you know, that I need to go to, like that with this next book, Daughter uh, of the Morning Star. Are, like and I'm working very uh, an awful lot, you know, with the National Indigenous um, Women's Resource Center that's up in Lame Deer, um, which was really advantageous to me, you know, because the amount of uh, of missing, you know, and murdered, you know, Indigenous women, it's like an incredible scourge, you know, in in Indian country, and you know, even in the acknowledgments, like it, I I started telling, you know, about you know what the numbers were, um, and you know, my publisher questioned me about it. Viking Penguin, you know, they said, is it, are these true? Are these numbers real? And I was like, yes, they are like that. And uh, one of the nice things that happened was when the first, you know, draft of the book came out, uh, went, went back, you know, to, to New York, um, the, the copy editor for the book made a donation um, to, to the organization like that. And I, I put all of their information in with the acknowledgements and I'm of great hopes like that, that we'll be able to, they're actually, uh, going to be, uh, one of the, 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 uh, the benefactors from uh, one of the, the groups that's going to, uh, a lot of the money from uh, Longmire days. We have two, uh, groups. We have a national charity that we give money to, and then a local charity that we give money to. And, and that organization is the, is the national charity that we'll be giving money to this year, which I'm very, very happy about. I mean, when you hear those numbers, it's just absolutely horrifying. I think that, you know, in Montana alone, um, Native women make up almost a quarter of the women that are, uh, that either disappear or are murdered. And that's insane like that because, you know, there's like what, only like eight or 9% of the population um, in Montana, um, that it's truly horrifying. Um, but I mean, that when you when you get an opportunity like that to reveal um, things like that, I think that also you know makes it makes it highly worthwhile. David, what do you I, think? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to just ask, what do you think people should do to prepare to write native? I I would love to weigh in on this, you know, because uh, uh, I think both Jane and Craig gave such wonderful stuff that I'd love to jump off on and and talk about what I do to prepare. But I, I want to, you know, kind of follow up on Craig's uh, uh, point as well. So the background to my book is a legal issue that also affects missing and murdered Indigenous women, although I don't really cover the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women in my book. My the, 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 the background of Winter Counts is the Major Crimes Act, which is a federal law which forbids uh, native nations from prosecuting felonies on their own lands. So if a felony crime happens on native territory and the uh, offender is native, uh, the, the tribal police have to call up the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office and send the case over to them. Okay, fine and dandy, except that U.S. prosecutors are declining to prosecute about 40% of these cases. So you have child abusers, rapists, murderers, abusers let free. And so what has happened is you have hired vigilantes like my character, Virgil Wounded Horse. He goes out and he will uh, beat up somebody who hurts your child or your wife. And he charges a hundred bucks for each uh, tooth he knocks out and each bone he breaks. <laughs> now, I get asked this question a lot. I, I get asked this, are there actually vigilantes on reservations? And the answer is yes. Okay. Now, to research this, I, I you know, what I did, what, what did I do to prepare? I... I have not met any vigilantes myself in person, but I did talk to a lot of people on my reservation. Uh, I am, again, an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation. I grew up in Denver, but I spent summers on the reservation. Now, having said that, you know, there's a lot that goes on on the reservation, and if you're not there full time. So what did I do to prepare? Mainly, I, want, I went back to the res to get the slang correct, the words correct, and the customs correct, you know, because, um, that I, I messed up a lot. And I have about 100 Lakota words in my book. And boy, did I make some whoppers, okay? So I went to our tribal university, Sinte Gleshka University, and I went to the Lakota language people. And, and they, you know, they, they really saved me from embarrassing myself. But I, I just want to close with this, because Craig, I was so delighted to hear that people that you put the missing and murdered indigenous women center into your acknowledgments. I also, in my afterward to winter counts, I 
added some information about the Major Crimes Act. And I'm so delighted to tell you that a couple of staffers from various uh, Congress people have contacted me and said that they are interested in sponsoring some legislation to amend the Major Crimes Act to make it more equitable for Native people. Now, I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but they contacted me. And, you know, this is just really wonderful to to have some sort of minor effects on the culture at large. So I'll I'll leave it there. Well, and one of the things ages ago, someone told me that um, one of the purposes of fiction is to move people, is to get them to do something, whether it's, you know, go visit that place that they read about or whether it's to make a, make a difference in their life. But I think those are great examples of people that were moved by the stories of these, um, by the stories of these women, by the stories of Virgil, that what was happening. So I, I think that's a really important part of writing Native and writing any kind of writing is that we wanna move people. We want people to care about these characters and what their lives are like. And maybe as a result of that, things might really change. And I think this is you know, the story of Natalie Curtis. That was part of what her passion was, is that she was lost to her music and when she realized there was a code of offenses of 1883, that's very much like this, um, you know, the law that prohibited all these different things for native people to be able to do as part of their culture. She used her influence with Teddy Roosevelt and some other people um, to, to get permission to actually record those music, that music. And she had to struggle with, wouldn't it be better if native people recorded this? Um, but the fact was, there wasn't anybody there to do that and so she did that and so then there were questions of you know appropriation what did she do with that but the important thing is that she was moved by the music and i'm hoping that readers will be moved by her decision to to get engaged and to take a risk on behalf of other people okay on to the next so let's see we talked about preparation next up um does, and you guys kind of hit this too, that, that isn't it better to have a story? And Jane, uh, you talked a little bit uh, with David Jasper about American dirt. Uh, and that caused all kinds of, of uh, heel kicking. Isn't it better to have an American dirt out there that writes about the struggle of, in, in this case, Hispanic people trying to come into the United States who are not walking a thousand miles through a desert um, in order to uh, buy nicer clothing or something. They're doing it because they need to live. Um, and that, uh, that book shows that. Isn't it better to have that out there than even if it's not written by somebody that is, is Hispanic or is Native American or whatever? Doesn't every book kind of call attention to a plight? Well, uh, Jean Jeannie Cummings, one of the quotes um, that she in the interviews that she had is she said that we ought to be we ought to be uh, writing bridges. We ought to do what we can to, to make a bridge. And that's what I think books do, even if they're controversial, even if people are saying, you know, she shouldn't have written that or whatever. Um, that if that if it's there and the, and as a result of that, there are conversations that can make a difference. Um, it's a bridge. Um, and I think that's, you know, I guess that's what I look for. If, if there's controversy, you know, how can, that, how can that be converted into something that could move things forward into, in a more positive way? So, yeah. Or maybe that's the old line, there's no bad publicity. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, we're probably now going to move over to questions from the audience. And before we do that, I just want to give people a little preview of something at Craig Johnson's event with us in September 22nd that you can uh, email me, sunriverbooks at sunriverbooks.com if you want to get a ticket to attend that. Um, his wife is probably gonna have these. Judy Johnson, also known as Vic from the series, uh, <laughs> It has a store and she's got all these great things. I have on the shirt, but I can't really show that. I, I don't know. I, I, could, I have on the matching shirt. Uh, so we'll have this at the event too, probably, assuming all goes well with UPS and such on September 22nd. Uh, so that'll be for Daughter of the Morning Star. Um, no, no hats at Jane's event. 
masks though. <laughs> okay. And that'll be at Sept on September 4th. So September 4th, Jane and September 22nd, Craig. So now we'll move on to some things from the audience. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and type that in now in the little question and answer thing. I think we've got a few over here. I just need to move my little box over. It's uh, there we go. So first up, I've got Karen Jones. This is to all speakers. When you write your native characters, are you concerned about how your readers will react to a character of native descent? or one of a different ethnicity than your own? Do you write more cautiously because they're different? I'll jump in. Um, for me, like that, uh, it's a, you have to be ca cautious with all your characters. You have to be cautious with all of them all the time, um, especially in the particular genre that I work in like that because, you know, it's a murder mystery like that. And so nuance, you know, plays you know, such a large part um, and everything that you do like that. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, in many ways, it's, it's a little bit of a shell game, you know, whenever you're writing a you know, the mystery genre, because, you know, people are, there are a certain percentage of the people that are reading the book to find out who did it. And your job is to kind of play that chess game with them all the way through till page, you know, 350 like that, where you finally have the reveal. Um, I think, you know, that, yeah, you have to be careful with all of those type of, uh, of characters, like all of the characters like that. But then again, I think you also have to feel free um, to make them multidimensional like that and to make them as real as you possibly can. Um, you know, the, the ones that are painful are the ones that, you know, uh, kind of go in, in that direction, well, either direction, like that, just too far um, with taking any of the characters and making them, you know, overly romanticized to the point that they're painful, you know, to, to read or to demonizing, like at the characters to the point, you know, to where they're you know, difficult to read. Um, and that's just, you know, I think it, it, that goes across the board in all forms of literature, it seems to me. I, I, I can jump in. Um, I will tell you that I felt a, you know, first of all, thank you uh, for the question, uh, whoever submitted it. Uh, it's a great question. I felt a huge responsibility and probably I, I had more anxiety about this very issue than anything else in the writing of the book, because I am, I believe, the first Lakota crime writer. There have been other native uh, 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 crime writers. Marcy Randon is great. She's up in Minnesota. There are some other great folks. But to my knowledge, I'm the first one uh, from the Lakota nation. And so I wanted to portray my reservation honestly, but positively. And so I really thought about all of this stuff a lot. And I was concerned about the effect because, you know, I, I didn't want to turn my eyes away. We do have some terrible poverty on our reservation. The unemployment rate is, is 85%. Uh, the average life expectancy for a native man on the Lakota reservation is 47 years old. We have a lot of problems there. And I didn't want to turn my eyes away from those, but I didn't want to turn it into what sometimes is called poverty porn. And so that's sort of a criticism that's made of some native writers. Um, and, and so I wanted to show the joy, the resilience, the humor of native people. A lot of people think we're all stoic, but natives are like some of the funniest people out there. So I, I really was concerned about the effect, you know, since I knew that winter counts would be the only probably literature that ever had ever read about the Rosebud Reservation. I really gave it a lot of thought. So thank you so much for that wonderful question. And I, I just got to jump in real quick here too. Like, and I think that but one of the key elements there like that, and, you know, and, and David's obviously is an incredible writer like that and very, very funny writer too, like that. And uh, that, that's also one of the key elements, I think, to that humanity that we've discussed also like that. I mean, whenever I'm doing a writer's workshop or something, I always have students that'll ask, they'll say, well, how do you get people to, you know, empathize, you know, with your characters? And I'm like, give them a sense of humor. Like, and inevitably the first thing out of their mouth then is, yeah, but what if I don't have a sense of humor? And then you have to look at them and go, yeah, you're, you're kind of in deep trouble then really, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Jane, didn't mean to interrupt. Go right ahead. Um, I think I, I probably was more uh, vigilant. I'm not cautious, but more vigilant. And in, in this last book in particular, um, because Natalie had associations with over 18 different tribes that she um, interacted with. And I, I wanted to have the characters that she was involved with be, um, be unique, be singular, because I do think there is a tendency to think, oh, it's sort of like somebody said, um, all Indians walk in uh, 
walk in a single file, at least the one I saw was. And so it's like that um, stereotypical belief about all Indians being the same and trying to make sure that there was something unique or singular about each of the interactions that she had with the different people so that a reader would know these were an, uh, incredibly complex um, relationships and associations and histories uh, that Natalie was interacting with and, and working to get them to give her permission to record these songs. And so I, I felt like I had to be um, vigilant about doing that. So in, in that sense, um, maybe I was also more cautious, but great question. Yeah, great question. Next, next question comes from Ted Haynes. Howdy, Ted. Ted is uh, also an author. He's written mysteries set here in uh, Central Oregon. First in the series is Suspects, and his new one is The Mount Bachelor Murders. And Ted has got a question for you. Um, just wanted to give that little shout out first before I got to the question. What do you think of They're There by Tommy Orange, where some of the uh, Indian characters are not that admirable and the powwow is not entirely credible? Is this more harmful or more enlightening? Okay, I'm going to admit that I like They're There, so. <laughs> what do you guys think? Well, I'll jump in and I'll deflect this because Tommy is a friend of mine and uh, Tommy uh, did in fact blurb the book, as did Mr. Craig Johnson, who was most kind to give me a wonderful, wonderful endorsement, which I was so deeply honored to receive, as did Tommy Orange. Um, I, I do love They're There. And, you know, I think it, it is a, a landmark book because he had, you know, massive success nominated for the Pulitzer, the National Book Award, you know. Um, and, and so, I mean, look, you know, reading is such a subjective thing, you know, uh, uh, literature, you know, some people didn't like the powwow and didn't care for some of the characters, but I just don't think you can ignore Tommy Orange's effect on the culture. He's opened a lot of doors for native people. So I'll just say native writers. So I'm going to say that, that, that I liked the book and, uh, and I, in fact, I think it's a great book, but you know, everybody's entitled. So I'll leave it there. Craig and Jane. And did you read Tommy Tommy's I, book? I did, um, and and I I you know ditto what David just said and um, about the influence that he's had and the and the remarkable um, spread that he had about the story. I I personally found it hard. I I found it um, more violent than what I'm comfortable with as a as a reader, but I read it and um, and got totally engaged in various scenes. I mean, he's an incredible writer and you're, you're lost to whatever else is going on when you're in that scene. But it was harder for me. It's harder for me to, I mean, I, I will, I'm more easily able to recommend David's book, for example, that had some violence in it, or even for Longmire, who's, you know, that he can even can still walk because of all the horrible things that keep happening to him. Easier for me to recommend those. Um, and, um, but certainly, have to acknowledge just the impact that um, Tommy Orange has had on, on the literature and on the genre. So, yeah. Craig? I, I, I thought it was a wonderful book, like, but it's also more of a slice of life, you know, piece of literature yeah. like that. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that, you know, there's going to be a litmus test, you know, from every author. We're all going to, you know, we, we would all be standing on the same street corner and see the same thing happen, but we would all describe it so differently. Um, and that's really the, the beauty and the wonder, you know, uh, of writing, um, those perspectives that people can have like that. And uh, I, I do think, you know, and I think David kind of touched on this earlier on, like that you can get into a lot of trouble when you start censoring, you know, when you start, you know, uh, taking away, you know, some of the tools um, that authors have, you know, to try and, you know, give a view, you know, of what their perspective is like that. And so, um, I think you got to take the good with the bad like that. And, uh, and those degrees are going to be different with each author that you read. Right. Okay. Uh, just as uh, throwing out a bookseller question to follow up Ted's, um, he mentioned some of the characters uh, are not admirable. And um, I remember a book club we did where not all of the book club members enjoyed it. The author's going to remain nameless. He's actually, uh, quite uh, well regarded, but tends to write books that have a more inclusive range of the way people behave. And so isn't it 
doesn't it feel kind of sometimes more real if you have somebody that is maybe conflicted, maybe good sometimes and not always, or somebody that is is uh, perhaps not uh, laudable. I mean, isn't uh, even uh, to have a native character, all of the native characters behave like they're saints. That wouldn't that that wouldn't feel right. But the most fun characters to write are the villains. Are the, are the less than admirable, I think, that, you know, they're more fun to write. Um, well, that's my two cents, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think ambiguity is a, a wonderful thing like that, you know, whenever you're writing, um, you know, it's not all white hats and black hats, you know, it's all gray hats. And whenever people are reading a book, you know, about a character who's maybe just a little bit too good for their own good, they're waiting to see, you know, what are the, what are the problems, you know, what are the accidents, what are the things they're going to do wrong? I mean, the old statement is, is that you, you know, you, you like people for their virtues, but you love them for their faults. Um, the other thing is, is the, those bad characters, you know, it's, it think, I think it's a human nature, like a, to, you know, to wait and see, you know, maybe that bad character or quote unquote bad character is going to turn out to do the right thing. Maybe they're going to turn around and, you know, kind of save the day. You never know, you know, so that, that kind of ambiguity is always something that's a powerful tool, I think, in the writing and character development. And I'll just jump in quickly and say, I, I teach at a couple of master of fine arts programs in creative writing. And I, I have my students do an exercise, exactly what Craig is suggesting here. I, I have them rewrite scenes if they've made their, their antagonist, their villain too one dimensional. I have them rewrite the scenes to make the antagonist, you know, the bad guy or bad woman, a little more humanized, a little more sympathetic. And then I also make their protagonist. I make them try to make their protagonist, their hero, a little more complicated as well. You know, so I think those are the books that are, at least for me anyway, that are the richest and, and, and most fun to read. Okie doke. Uh, coming up, we've got a question from Anonymous. And Anonymous wants to know, uh, for a new author who would like to include uh, a certain native culture in a book, what is the best way to approach or contact uh, a tribal member to request information? Oh boy, I, I should probably take this one. So, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I, 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 this is another question that I get a fair amount of the time. Um, and, and I wanna be clear here that the, the, the manner in which you approach someone, if you want information makes all the difference, okay? Because sometimes people will approach people on my reservation and just like demand information um, and, and that's not gonna work. The other thing is, is that sometimes Native people, if they don't know you, it takes a little while to be accepted into the circle. And sometimes there's a reserve that I think throws off a lot of people. And so you should not necessarily be offended by that. But I would say, if you go about it the right way, most people are going to be remarkably willing to help you, but not if you come in with an attitude like, I'm the savior here to to save, you know, your your reservation and your problems. And if you talk to me, you know, that that sort of attitude doesn't go very far. Do the research first and, and have, you know, a, a humble attitude. And that that takes you a long way. OK, uh, we have another anonymous. A nearby park has been named for a local indigenous group. I want to write a travel article for the web about why this park was named. Any suggestions? I'm not quite sure the, is the question asking, how do I find out information <coughs> about this park um, and all of that um, or, or, or what? I'm not quite sure. I'm clear on the question. Do, do you okay, guys have I'm a clear idea? There. I, I don't either. Anonymous, if you'd like to elaborate a little bit on, on that question, uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, so next up, Susie Wingen. Uh, Jane, you have a background in working in mental health. Uh, do you use some of your, your, your characters to bring awareness to mental health issues? And then for David and Craig, do you use any of your characters to bring awareness to a particular uh, issue? <coughs> so Jane, you're up. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I can avoid it. I think it's just part of my, um, part of who I am that I spent years involved in mental health and um, and listening to people and, and trying to help, I, I would say, walk beside them. And I think that's part of what I do in, in telling these stories. Uh, I know when I left my job as a mental health director, my parents and everybody else who we knew thought we had 
you know, dropped off the end of the planet for leaving uh, behind and doing our little homesteading thing, which is what my husband and I did. Um, but I found that the that writing, especially writing about stories based on the lives of actual people, um, is actually a good blend of mental health. And um, so part of part of my practice in in writing these stories is to ask myself how these particular women, particularly women, um, where did they draw their strength from? How did they get from here to there? Um, and I think those are great mental health questions that uh, are, as people read a lot of my books, the, the feedback I get are that these are characters that they feel like know what their troubles are and they can see how they are working through those troubles. So I don't really feel like I left mental health um, work at all. I just feel like I was able to blend it in a way that um, I think is, has really been gratifying for, for me as a writer, but also apparently a lot of readers have said. Uh, one story that I just love was a woman who said that her daughter was in prison and that she would ask whenever one of my books came out, the publisher to send it directly because she couldn't send the, she couldn't take the book to the prison. It had to be sent from the publisher. But she said, but they would both read the same book. And then when she went to visit, they would have a conversation. They would have something to talk about, um, about how that character handled this or didn't handle that or whatever. She said, it was like we were building new memories because so many of their memories were full of angst and pain. Um, and that the stories of these people were stories that were bringing she and her daughter closer together. I, I just found that, you know, that's like best review ever um, to know that that was a way that uh, those stories were being used. So the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David and Craig, uh, do you use any of your characters to bring awareness to a particular issue? That's Take it away, you. David. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've already mentioned that that sort of the, the, the central construct of the book is, of Winter Counts is the broken criminal justice system on reservations. And I need not go into that again. Uh, I am an attorney and I'm also a professor of Native American studies. So I've been reading and researching about these issues for, for years and years and years. And I wanted to bring awareness to just how truly fractured and broken criminal justice laws are for natives. I mean, you've got federal laws, state laws, tribal laws, you know, it's just, it's a true mess. And I wanted to inform about that. But in Winter Counts, I also wanted to bring attention to some other issues, our broken healthcare system. We receive healthcare from something called the IHS, the Indian Health Service. And, and often we don't get great doctors. That's not always true, but sometimes it's true. Um, we have problems with food distribution. And mainly I wanted to bring attention to the role of treaties. So treaties were obviously, you know, I could lecture for an hour here, put on my professor hat, but they were, you know, they were agreements, sacred agreements between the US government and a sovereign nation. Native nations are sovereign independent nations, and these are not supposed to be broken, but they were. And um, so I wanted to bring awareness also to some of the problems that we have with treaties and, and, and like, for example, commodities. We get, as, as part of the bargain that was made with the United States, US took the land, but they agreed to give us free health care and free food. But our commodity food distribution system is also a true mess. We don't have healthy, sustainable food on reservations. And often they're food deserts where there are no grocery stores within 100 miles. So there are lots and lots of problems here. But I didn't want my book to be just a travelogue of problems. So I tried to bring it in organically. You do. I, I think that, you know, for me, like the speaking in more general terms as an author um i think for me like and i i would imagine that you know both david and jane will agree that you know writing a book is an arduous process like it's a you know at least a year-long process that you're going to get on that horse and you're going to ride and the the my favorite quote about that of course is that you know with voltaire's quote about clever ideas come and go um and you can come up with a clever idea for your book but you know what about three or four months down the road that clever idea is going to start wearing thin, like it is what's going to happen like that. And so what I've discovered is for me, I tend to refer to it as the saddle, uh, the, the, the burr under the saddle blanket school of writing. Um, one of the things it seems to me with my own nature, and I, I, I think maybe with a lot of authors is, is that if there's something out there that, you know, that's just unjust or that's wrong or that pisses you off, um, it's one of those things that you can, you can use that as fuel. 
and it'll stay with you for a good long period of time in your attempts to try and answer that problem or deal with that problem or face that problem. Um, and so for me, whenever I'm sitting down to think about, you know, what book it is I want to write, one of the things I'm always asking, asking myself is, what, what am I trying to say here? What message am I trying to get across here? And, you know, as long as, you know, you have that, it doesn't necessarily have to be a needlepoint, you know, up above your writing desk or anything, but just, you know, as a, a thought process to kind of, you know, keep the, the, the motivation for the book going. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty handy device to have. Okay. So Dan, I wanna go back just, just real briefly to the question about writing about the park. Um, yeah. The name was changed. And I would just encourage that person to talk to the park department first and identify who they talked with. Because in some states, the renaming of things is really kind of a complex, uh, all kinds of you know, machinations have to go on about who gets to name whatever, especially uh, pieces of landscape, like the names of mountains or that sort of thing. And there's a quite a big process usually to, to go through to get a name change. So I think the park would be the place to start and find out who were their contacts, who did they talk to, what tribal people were they involved in to get that name change. I think it could be a really great story um, because usually that doesn't happen without a whole lot of effort on somebody's part to get that name change. So and that's Jane, I'm your timing is perfect because I think our anonymous might be Betsy Bark because we just got one from Betsy Bark and uh, she's uh, referring to uh, a prior question it says yes how how do you find your your research information like and which you just answered and i uh, how do you uh find beta readers oh beta readers <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have any beta readers um, <laughs> My editor is my beta reader, and then she gets back to me, and then I and then I work on revisions. So I don't know. I think you just ask. Um, you could put out to the universe and say, "I've I've finished this manuscript, and this is what it's about." And I'm looking for somebody to kind of, you know, maybe if you have a critique group or something like that. But I always lived in such isolated areas that I never, you know, and that was before the internet. But I've never been in a critique group, so I I don't know. Maybe you guys have beta readers, but. <laughs> My husband, my husband is a good beta reader. I read it out loud to him so that I can get the rhythm and, and the sounds that are, are complicated. And he will, he will say, oh, I knew she was going to do that. And so that will tell me that I'm not, I need to get more ambiguity in there, as, as Craig would say. So he's my beta reader. <laughs> and otherwise, I don't know how people get them. Well, I'll just talk about beta readers. I'm fortunate in that my partner is the, uh, she's in the other room, is the native writer, Erica Wirth. And so she, uh, she and I, we trade manuscripts, although that's always a delicate thing to, you know, critique your, your partner. And I'll give a little plug for her. Uh, she has a book coming out from Flatiron called uh, White Horse uh, in about a year or so. She just signed, as they say in the business, a major deal with Flatiron to bring out a uh, uh, a great new uh, native book about the urban Indian experience. So, so she's got something coming out as well. So we 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 bat things back and forth. <laughs> I, I, I'll take I'll take it in a different direction because everybody knows that Judy reads every word that I write. Um, and you know, yeah, it, it, David's right. I mean, that's a slippery slope. You know, a lot of people ask us, well, should I have my husband or my wife, you know, read my books? You know, well, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, it's according. You know, but uh, I remember one time I was in, at the LA Book Festival, like, and there was a big name author on the panel, and somebody asked, they said, you know, well, how do you do your research? And he goes, I don't do that stuff. I have people to do that stuff for me. And I remember, you know, kind of sitting there and feeling like, you know, that didn't seem quite right. And uh, I finally figured out why it is, you know, for me, you know, first of all, <clears throat> writing a book is a very personal thing, you know, and so, you know, a, a lot of that information, a lot of that research, you know, it kind of makes the book for what it is. The other thing is, is that you don't know what you're looking for. I mean, you know, you think you know what you're looking for, but then as the research process kind of evolves and these things, you know, kind of reveal themselves to you, you discover things that open up whole new worlds, you know, for your writing like that. And, you know, you can't tell somebody to look for that kind of thing. That's an aesthetic, you know, that you have to have um, with your own process like that. And so, you know, they may go find, you know, A, B and C like that, but then you've lost, you know, mm -hmm. all of the nuance 
and all the stories that are in between. And so that, that kind of speaks to doing your own research, I think. Okay, so Betsy, uh, I've also got a reply for you from Christine, who has said that she'd be happy to be a beta reader for anyone. So if you, uh, Christine and Betsy, just email me at sunriverbooks at sunriverbooks.com and I'll put the two of you together. Um, I would just also add that writer's workshops can be a good way to go. Just be sure you're getting a writer that is actually successfully published because there are lots of writer's workshops where maybe the writer teaching it is not. Um, so Jane teaches one, I think, don't you still? Every now and then. Yeah, I Jane does. I just um, did the library. Yeah, just use kind of library. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, Pam Houston does. There, there are several that you could find uh, uh, that are guild that I'm offers sorry. Central Oregon Writers Guild in our area. Oh, yeah, there's lots of different kinds of workshops that are excellent. So, yeah, I want to add something that Stephen King said about um, he he would give everything he wrote to his wife, and she is a she is a poet. But he said he would watch her read it and where she could put it down because she heard the dryer buzzer go or the kids yell or something. And she would get up and go look at that. He would trot right over there to see what section of that book was not compelling enough to keep her there. And then he would rework it. So oh, that's, that's clever. Writing. I love that. I, I remember that story. Yeah. Well, the most story. feared words uh, around the ranch here whenever I'm writing a book is uh, when Judy will read something I've written and she'll say, is there another way to say this? <laughs> you know, that's the most, I, that, that is like, a, it, it's just like a, a, you know, a spear through the heart like that, you know. And what the example I always use is, is the red hot gun barrel swung around under the looming mountains, you know, well, you know, the damned gun barrel is always red hot. The mountains are always looming like it. And I'm always telling students, you know, well, if it sounds like something that you've read before, guess what? You probably have like, and so you need to shove that stuff aside like that. And then maybe go with another, another, another set of words, maybe. I like that, Craig, yeah. the red hot gun barrel. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here's one from one of my pals, Carol Morton. Hi there, Carol. Uh, in a narrative arc of a book, the characters change in your in your own narrative arcs as writers. How has writing narrative native changed for you? Let me try that again. In in a narrative arc of a book, the characters change in your own narrative arcs as writers. How has writing native changed you? Oh, okay. So how has the writing changed you? And Carol is also a very good writer, by the way. She is a journalist. Okay, guys, how are you changed by your stories? Um, so I'll just jump in. I, I don't think I'll take a lot of time with this, but um, I did not, I did not know that by writing these stories um, that I would learn so much about myself. Um, that I, I, I thought I was telling a story about a particular woman. Um, or a particular time or a particular event. But at the end of each, I'm always sort of startled and I sit back and go, oh, that was why I was supposed to write that book. Um, and so, and I don't, I don't think it's exclusive to Native. I think there are, you know, each, each book, whether there have been Native characters in the book or not, I've, I've learned something about myself. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, maybe that's part of the universality thing that you were talking about earlier, Craig, that that each of the characters, if I've been able to be inside their skin, has taught me something that I really needed to know. And I don't think I would have ever discovered that if I hadn't chosen to write that story. So that's my, how I've changed. I'll, I'll jump in quickly because I've got sort of a thought for Craig and I, you know, I'll just jump in and say it. I'll, I'll be, I'll be brief here. So I, I was changed. Uh, Winter Counts is, is a, about the reservation, but it's also about Virgil Wounded Horse's personal journey. He's an Ayeska, which is a Lakota word for a, a half breed. It's sort of a slur. And so I, I, I myself am, am a, a, an Ayeska, so I am, a, you know, mixed race. And, and it really did affect me in the writing of it. A lot of things that I'd buried came up. But I want to talk about the narrative arc because I thought that's where the, the, the question was coming from. I'm now reading Mr. Craig Johnson's second book in the Longmire series, and because I'm writing the sequel to Winter Counts right now, and writing the second book in a series is turning 
out to be a lot more difficult than I'd realized. So I, I am not kidding. I'm right now, I'm going through your book and I'm seeing how did he do this in book two? And I'm also doing this with Ken Kruger, who's a friend of mine. I'm reading the second book in his uh, uh, Cork O'Connor series. So I'm going to a lot of folks and I'm taking a look at their second book. It's like, what strategies did they use here? I know that wasn't exactly the question, but I'm having a lot of fun going back to uh, uh, Longmire and just seeing how you, early on in your series, how you structured the journey, you know, for Walt. So I'll leave it there. A, a lot of people don't take that into consideration, you know, before they, they you know, they, they, they find themselves um, in that situation. Like, I mean, you know, everybody's heard the story about how I, I stuck, you know, my you know, first two chapters in a drawer for like 10 years and then pulled it back out and did it like it. So my first novel took, you know, over 12 years to write, you know, and then, you know, of course it got picked up. Like getting the first thing the publisher says is, can you have another one for us here in about six months? You know, and you're like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, <laughs> better get on that horse and ride like that because uh, this is, this is coming up pretty quick here. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, that that's, you know, that, that, that's a, that's a great idea. I've never heard anybody do that before. So once again, you know, David's like on the forefront here, figuring out how to do this stuff <laughs> ahead of all of us like that. But I, I guess whenever I, I heard the question like that, the thing that I heard was, um, there's a Tony Hillerman had a great quote. He had some like great maxims like that, that he would just toss out, you know, during, uh, during dinner. And uh, one of the big ones for him was, is you got to sit in all the chairs, you know, that's, that's the big issue. Like and that kind of goes back also to the initial um, questions that we were dealing with, you know, with this particular zoom uh, seminar um, in that, you know, you, you really have to be all those characters. And if you're moving around that table, you know, being all those characters, and you're trying to really understand them and trying to properly motivate them, you can't help but be moved in some way um, and, and come to some kind of an understanding, you know, with all of those characters. Um, and that's always the great joy of it too, like that to have somebody say, you know, well, you know, especially if you're talking about the antagonist, you know, particularly, you know, in a, a piece of crime fiction, you know, one of my favorite comments after somebody reads one of my books is, I, I really didn't like that character, but I, I really understood why it is that they did what they did. Um, and I can see how you could be put in a position where, you know, that's, that's what you would do like that. And I, I think that once again, you know, I think um, deals with the question there at hand, you know, in that you do, you, you, you have to, you have to put that skin on and walk around or else, you know, why bother? Last two questions. Uh, so I've got one from Linda Frey. Uh, a good question for what you, you're talking about with writing native. She says, how much creative license should I allow myself when writing about native Americans who are known historically, but not much personal data is available about them? Hmm. Um, uh, I, one of the quotes I like is from Virginia Woolf, and she was speaking about writing about historical women. She <clears throat> said, uh, women's history must be invented, um, both uncovered and made up, because there's only so much that we can know about them. And so I, I think that you can take, um, I, I try to be as faithful as I can to what I call the shared knowings. These are things that everybody agree about that historical character. But then um, I assume that, I've, that my understanding of human nature and the nature of the plot and all those other things allow me to expand that. So um, it's true that some of the foamers might come back and say, oh no, that, you know, I'm sure that that didn't happen. You know, Chief Joseph wasn't there at that time or whatever. Um, but if I have some evidence and I have some information um, that uh, I can authenticate my perspective, then I think that I'm okay to, um, to still be respectful of the historical um, context, but also integrate my own imagination and how that story moves forward. That's a tough uh, question just simply because there are so many facets to it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, it, what it deals with an awful lot, I think is, um, is nonfiction. You know, there, there's a, a major movement in the last, you know, 20 years, you know, that kind of uh, went towards, you know, a, a more of a creative sense of nonfiction, you know, where they, you know, were literally able to take, uh, I think the, the, the Killer Angels, I think was, you know, probably one of the early ones like that, that dealt with that to a great extent. Um, but, you know, to be able to take, you know, dialogue or lines 
that were from letters that had been written and to put them in the mouths of the characters, you know, so that it could be, you know, I guess, give it an impetus, like to give it an energy, I think like that. And, you know, it's tough like that because, you know, a lot of people are going to say, you know, you can't do that. You know, that's not the way it happened. We have no idea what the, what the conversation was like. Um, we know that a conversation took place there, but we have no record of like what it was or what was said. But then again, you know, the other side of that, of course, is, is that it does make an awful lot of very dry history infinitely more readable, like that, because it breaks it down onto a more human level. Um, whenever you're dealing with big epic issues or great, you know, magnificent moments in history, one of the big tricks is, is breaking it down to a, a human level, you know, because that's what we are, you know, we're human beings. And, you know, we can talk about, you know, all of those great words, egalite, fraternite, uh, and all of that, like that, but, you know, in the final analysis, it's always going to be people and people acting, like, and, and people speaking. And so then the question becomes, how much freedom do you have in that? And uh, once again, it's another one of those tight ropes that you have to walk uh, to try and tell your story like that, but also be truthful. Uh, I can jump in briefly. I don't write historical fiction. Um, I did write a children's book, nonfiction called Spotted Tail, but that was a different thing altogether. It was pretty much a picture book, but I am writing a play right now. I was asked to write a play and it is a it is set at the Carlisle Indian School. My grandmother was a student at the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and uh, we don't know a lot about certain figures back there. Uh, uh, Colonel Pratt, Captain Pratt, who who founded the school, and so I'm taking complete liberty in my play, which I'm working on to to just make Pratt and some of the other people back there whom I want them to be. Uh, now. You should really not take my advice on this, though, because I'm brand new at writing a play, and I'm pretty sure that I'm botching the entire thing. So, um, you know, so, so, but for whatever it's worth, I'm, I'm running with it, you know, but, but, but I would say maybe talk to somebody who actually writes historical fiction, of which I'm not, I'm not that person. Well, that's a tough road to hoe, too, like that, because I mean, what is a play? It's dialogue. You know, and so, you know, there weren't too many recordings, you know, of the Carlisle School, so at least that I'm aware of. Like, and so, yeah, you, you, in, in a theatrical sense, then I think that you have a, a certainly, you know, much more of a demand, you know, for, uh, for, you know, developing some dialogue, I think, somewhere along the way. Kidok, last question is from Herm Meister. You know Herm Craig, he's a member of the Red Pony Club. Uh, so, how often do you start a book and abandon it? When you get an idea, do you push through or sometimes do you just change directions? Focus on a, pro uh, on a project must be difficult. So how often do you start a book and just go, that one's gone? You want, want me to jump in on this one real quick? Like I can, I can do this one. Like uh, the, the, I think that by the time, you know, I, I don't know what everybody else's experiences are, but you know, whenever I'm getting ready to start another book, it's like a horse race. You know, I've got so many ideas in my head and they're all wanting to be number one. They're all wanting to be the one that gets, you know, put down on paper. And, um, you know, by that time, you, know, you, you generally have, you know, a clear winner at that point like that. And, uh, and you've done a lot of thought, you know, a lot of thoughts gone into it. Um, and it's chomping at the bit. I hate to use all the horse, you know, adages, but it's just, it's my life. Sorry. But uh, anyway, like that, that's, you know, that, that once you jump in and start on that, you know, then you've done as much research as you can. You've done as much thought as you can to putting that generally, it's probably not something that you're going to put in like, you know, 200 pages in and then suddenly decide to toss it away. Like that. now things can get a little bit more experimental for me as far as, you know, short stories are concerned or novellas because that's not quite the investment, you know, that, you know, the full, you know, year of working on a book is going to be like that. I mean, I can just have an instance that happens and I'm like, I'm going to write that down and just see where it goes and what happens because, you know, generally short stories are, you know, anywhere from like six to 12 to 20 pages long um, or a novella like that. That's like, you know, 150 pages long. You can take more chances um, and being a little bit more improvisational in those situations like that. But boy, once you sit down and start in on a book, boy, you better be ready to go like that. And you better have some good, strong ideas of what it is you're going to do at that point in time. Okay. So I have, I have, um, well, I have contracts, so I know I have a deadline and I, you know, I have all that to operate on, but um, I have started a book um, 
now and then where that I thought was going a particular direction and you know three quarters of the way or half of the way in it it didn't it was going somewhere different and that's when I would have conversations with my editor to talk about okay this is happening what do you think's going on or what's the direction you know should I just plow through this do you think or is there some merit in where the story is taking me and so um, that's happened. That's happened once or twice, and it's always been um, the editor has always been my greatest guide and has made it a, a much better book. And that I've paid attention to whatever, the, whatever it was that was shifting that I hadn't originally thought. So, so it happens, but there's a way through it. Let me put it that way. I haven't ever put it back in the drawer. Because <laughs> so David, how's that second book coming along, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm the newbie in this room. I I don't have the luxury of abandoning a book, you know. I I I, I got Harper Collins breathing down my neck for the next book. So, but 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 yeah yeah. I I have taken some short stories and thrown them in the drawer. But yeah, talk to me. Ask me that question again in five years. I might have a different answer. <laughs> Jonathan Evison had a bonfire, and it haunts me to this day when he admitted that because I think. What about all those stories in there that might have been okay in, you know, like you said, 10 years from now? And I could have read them as a reader. That was painful. So uh, Christine sent a little note saying, great information from all three authors. Um, so I want to thank again, uh, Jane, for coming up with the idea of a conversation in writing native. And also Jane for rescuing the stories of all these women from history that I um, have read about now through her books and thought, gee, we should all know about this person. Um, so thank you, Jane. Her new book comes out early September. Uh, we get to have it out September 4th because she'll be with us in person at Sun River Books and Music. And that book is The Healing of Natalie Curtis. And I promise you, you're really gonna like George, the brother. I, and David, thank you. Uh, apparently working on that second book. And I tell you, you will like the first book, Winter Counts. We've had a lot of them leave the store. People have come back in and thanked me for putting them in their hands. And um, Virgil, you, you will not forget Virgil. He has, he's got uh, Walt's tendency to let him people beat him up too much. I remember the one scene in your book and I kept thinking, Virgil, just take the bat and hit the guy. <laughs> Which, so maybe if I learn anything about reading it was that I'm quite violent. Um, <laughs> and Craig, boy, um, gotta say, I am so grateful to you for your loyalty to Sun River Books and Music over the years. Craig is my favorite cowboy. Every time I pick up one of his books and read them, it's like visiting old friends. Uh, I love these characters and uh, deeply. And I love the way he writes about them. Sometimes I'll go back over a page and just think, how did he think of the words? How did he make that sound that way? Is uh, there another way to say this? That's how I do it. Like, <laughs> well, then maybe I should be thanking Judy. Judy I don't know. Judy but jumps all over me and I have to rewrite it. Like, that's how it happens. Like, so. <laughs> Boy, they are good. And we are so grateful uh, to Craig for coming to us on September 22nd. And by the way, Ben has admitted that was your idea. So, <laughs> uh, so really have to thank you for coming to us on September 22nd uh, for the new book and uh, Daughters of the Morning Star. Uh, we'll see how Lolo and, uh, and Henry Standing Bear are getting along now. Uh, so you don't wanna miss that one. If you wanna come to any of these, these are ticketed events. They do require vaccination. And you can email me at sunriverbooks at sunriverbooks.com and I will make it happen. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to the audience and thank you for your questions. Um, and we've got, oh, and Carol Morton just sent a little thing saying, thanks, grateful to these fabulous authors for this interesting conversation. Uh, and Sheila Grange said, thank you so much. So you've got uh, thanks from all of us. Um, so we will now say good night. Anything from anybody? Good night, audience. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.